the Chapel Hill Vintage Jewels. Um, we're going to talk today about five things to know about Czech jewelry. I'll probably give you more than five things because there's a lot to talk about with Czech jewelry. My name is Julie Irving. I'm the owner of Chapel Hill Vintage Jewels and my shop is on Ruby Lane. There is a lot of Czech jewelry uh, on my shop so I encourage you to go visit and take a look. The first thing that I like to start off with in these video series is to talk a little bit about the company, in this case, the area. I like Czech jewelry a lot, so I've been studying it for kind of a long time, and there were a few things in that process that were confusing to me, and so I want to share with you kind of some clarification about this area. I actually had the opportunity last year to visit this area and it is about you fly into Prague which is now in the Czech Republic and drive about an hour and a half north into the Jezera mountains into a town called Jablonik. Now this town was originally called Gablons in northern Bohemia. But over the years with history, wars, different occupation, Bohemia became Czechoslovakia, which then became the Czech Republic. This area in the Jezera Mountains has always been a huge area for glass manufacturing. And in fact, it goes all the way back to the 16th century. If you know other things, we know Czech glass, beautiful glassware that came out of there. Some pottery came out of Czech. Um, garnets were uh, and, and still are today very much from that region. Um, so the, it became a really large area, I mean huge area, for the manufacturing of beads. Swarovski rhinestones, and jewelry, especially in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, when I went there, it was really interesting because, you know, I, I'm, I don't design jewelry, but I, I was looking to buy jewelry. And what I found was very little Czech jewelry there. We actually have more in the U.S. and I find more in Europe than I did in that location. And the reason for that, I think, is because a huge amount of the jewelry that was created there was exported to the U.S., to Japan, and Europe. So you're going to find better Czech jewelry there, at least that was my experience, than I actually did going to the location. But the manufacturing still stays. Now, it's not the size of what it was, but there are still manufacturers there who are making these components, many of them still by hand, and it was an absolutely fascinating process to have the chance to tour these uh, manufacturing facilities and old warehouses and look at all of, uh, of the beautiful uh, rhinestones and beads that are still created in that area. Um, back in the times, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, when it was really a huge producer, of the Czech jewelry. A lot of the manufacturers from the U.S. had facilities that they created so that they were close to the source of these and one of them was coral. So today we're not going to talk about jewelry that uses Czech components because that's a huge area. I mean basically all of the big manufacturers use Czech, Czech rhinestones. We're going to talk about jewelry that was made in the area, most of it in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. All right, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the signatures on Czech jewelry. And really, for the most part, most pieces of Czech jewelry are not marked. But what you're looking at right now, these pieces are all marked in one way or the other. Um, you see tags here. Uh, there's the brooch is marked, um, the necklace is marked, but 
It can be anything from Czechoslovakia, made in Czechoslovakia, Czecho, Czechoslav, and, and so many different iterations of spellings that it gets a little confusing. And unfortunately, I have not found any resource that gives any light on why they would be marked with such different spelling. The other thing to know about this is you have to use a loop because in some cases it's the jump ring that is marked check around the edge. So to see this is, is next to impossible, but all there are a lot of pieces that are signed, but I would say the majority of them are not. The third thing to know about Czech jewelry is really they, they had incredible production of different styles of jewelry. What we're looking at right now is the filigree brooches that they're very well known for. And when I visited the area, I didn't find a lot of filigree brooches, you know, as, as large as some of these others that I had. But what you're looking at on the black board is a salesman sample. So this came directly from the region and it has these four pins and I don't have any intention of removing those because to find a salesman sample from you know the 1920s is, is pretty unusual. But the salesman would take these samples to various stores and that's where they would purchase. But you can see the, I think it's got a look. Um, the, o the only variation you're seeing in here is the size of the pin but also whether the stones are backed with a foil or whether they're open back, such as the one, the large one that's in the center. As I said before, um, they really were famous for unusual colors, um, simulated stones, and by that I mean, you know, meant to look like diamonds, rubies, emeralds, etc. Uh, you see that more in the brooches than in, you know, beaded necklaces like you see here. Um, satin glass is very much Czech and so are these round and you saw a squared version of that in the bracelet. Here's an orchid one. Little beaded clusters. Uh, the rondelles also came from there. The little round sparkly things that used were used as um, embellishments in between the beads. And then this one, I don't know if you could see that up close, but this is called iris glass. And if you look very closely, you see that there's different stripes of colors that are in that glass. That is a, that, so iris glass is only from Czech and it is a difficult process to get different colors of glass um, together like that. Mosaics, safaret, lamp working, all come from Czech. Here is, an example of one that uses a lot of filigree components in it and that is also characteristic of Czech. Okay another thing that they did exceptionally well I mean they had wonderful craftsmen there you know who did had all different kinds of specialties but this is examples of Czech enamel work and if you look at these carefully all but the white one has these little leaves if you will with a color in them. All of them do. Um, just showing the, the craftsmanship in the enameling. This is, these are harder to find. Check jewelry with enameling in general are, are just m more difficult to find and they're more expensive when you do. I bet I, this is from my own collection and I bet you I bought that Wow, I'm embarrassed to say, probably 30 years ago. Um, it was quite a find, and I don't, I, I really haven't found one for myself with that kind of detail um, since. This is a set, so it's actually the clasp that has the matching um, design to the bracelet. But you can see a lot of these are using the, the C clasps in various forms, but mostly C-class. This one actually is push, but um, that's unique. So you can see, I hope you appreciate um, the workmanship that goes into these pieces. 
What we're looking at here are some of the new pieces that come out of Czech. And like I said, I visited these manufacturing, so they're still making these the old fashioned way. They have some of them are mold, some of them are hand done. Um, but the process is very laborious and it was very um, enlightening to see the work that, go, that goes into the single rhinestone and or bead. The pink set that you see here, I bought specifically to show you that sometimes you're seeing these on different sites but look at the back of them. These are unfinished because the, the plating process is not an easy one and there's less people with the expertise to do that. Now, when you are in this area, you can have them finished, but when they're finished, the gold finishing, the gold plating that's actually put on the back of them or silver, either one that you can get. But it's much, much shinier than anything that you'll see in an old piece. So I just wanted to show you an example of that. All the pieces in this are the same way. Lovely from the front, but the back is definitely unfinished. Also, some of this stuff is coming out of China um, as well, but this is a, a check. And then I wanted to show you um, an example of the the filigree work that was not just on the brooches, but was also on little perfume bottles. So these are Czech, examples of Czech perfume bottles with rhinestones mm -hmm. and the filigree settings. And these can be found today as well. So again, we're, we're talking about um, Czech today. And I want to explain something that, although they in, in the time that they were making massive amounts of, of Czech jewelry, there were large manufacturing facilities, but a lot of the piece work was done in little cottage industries that people built inside their homes. So you still see this throughout the Jazeera Mountains as little cottages with um, ovens in the middle and they maybe they were the stone setters maybe they did the enameling but it was definitely not just something in a single manufacturing and what you're looking at is an example of something that is created from original jet check beads and the original molds from these are early pieces for the most part, but they would have been from maybe 1900 to 1920, 30, that kind of range. So there are still people, this gentleman in particular, an elderly gentleman, you know, has a workshop set up in his home that I got to visit. And he bought up all of the molds that he could find and all of the jet black from the old stock. And so he's making these beautiful pieces uh, today that are very much all pieces of the past. If you uh, study Czech jewelry for very long, you're going to run into the name Nager Brothers. And this was two brothers who were um, born in Gablons. And they made jewelry from 1905 to the 1930s. Um, very unique style. This is another one where I just want to throw up a little red flag and say, these are not marked pieces. And you really need to study and understand the design of Nager because there's a lot out there that claims to be, and I, I, I just don't have any way to validate that. Um, you're looking at some examples of things that I'm pretty certain are Nager, but you always have that doubt unless you can find a direct resource that shows you that. And I'm also showing you pictures from a book um, that show Nager. Now, when I was in Jablonic, um, I was they have a they have a wonderful muse, a jewelry museum there, and that jewelry museum has obviously. Um, some very good examples of both the brooches in this filigree with uh, very unique stones and in the the long necklace beads that Nager Brothers made. So those I'm, you know, I'm very confident, but this is an area I'm still studying myself. The sad part about this is that um, 
these two Jewish brothers uh, left the factory that they had. They escaped to Bohemia and they continued to produce jewelry but in a very scaled down version. So there was a very, really a very short time they were producing and then later they were arrested in Prague and they both died in Auschwitz. So very sad story, very beautiful jewelry, very specific characteristics, the beaded jewelry, the necklaces. Sometimes have an Indian um, influence, uh, also, um, you know, really uniquely carved beads in them. Thanks for joining. I hope that you um, enjoyed looking at all this beautiful jewelry from the from Czech. The last uh, slide that you'll be looking at has some resources that I've put together, which gives you the title of a couple of books, um, of course, my shop, and some blogs on Nager Brothers jewelry specifically, and then a place to go look and do a little bit more research on marks and, and getting a little bit more history on Czech jewelry. Um, thanks for joining, and I appreciate it. Please visit my shop on Ruby Lane, Chapel Hill Vintage Jewels.